We have been in a series of messages here now with uh, the heroes of faith. In fact, we have on our stage here, we've got some interesting things that represent all the different Bible characters that Hebrews chapter 11 talks about. And it, it, the chapter highlights the amazing things that happened by faith. And if you have your Bibles, you may want to turn to Hebrews chapter 11 there. And we've had a series of messages this summer where we have talked about some of the people that are mentioned in this chapter, where one after another, these amazing people in the Old Testament did great exploits of faith. And we tried to pick out the stories that may be less well-known. And so we talked about aspects like uh, of, of life of Daniel and Samson and Jephthah, people like Barak, Rahab, and a bit of an, an obscure story with Elijah. And it's very encouraging to hear these amazing stories of faith. But you know, it can also be a bit discouraging to hear of miracles happening and great exploits of faith because sometimes people have been believing, having faith, and it seems like nothing happens. And it can be a bit discouraging. In fact, the problem that we might be praying about may be going on and on and maybe even getting worse. And then there are some who teach that it's actually your fault. If you just had enough faith or the right kind of faith, your problems would all go away. You'd always be healed. You wouldn't be in trouble. You wouldn't have tension. You wouldn't have any financial pressures because miracles just happen to those who believe. And if you don't have your miracle, it's because you haven't believed. And folks, that is a very discouraging message to hear because there are people who have believed and prayed and asked God and pled for God's help, and it hasn't happened. Well, I'm glad to tell you that in Hebrews chapter 11, which is the hall of fame for those of faith, there is a passage for those folk. And I invite you to turn your attention to Hebrews chapter 11, verses 35 to 39. After this long chapter of all these amazing heroes experiencing all these miracles, here comes the climax of the chapter. There were the others who were tortured, <clears throat> refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were Sawed in two. This is horrible stuff, folks. Sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. This does not sound like faith is working for them. But here's what the Scripture says about these people. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and holes in the ground. And look at the verse 39. These were all commended for their faith. And yet, none of them received what had been promised. Wow. This is the rest of the story about faith. These people who seemingly didn't have their miracles, who seemingly life was not working for them, are put in the hall of fame and said they are commended for their faith. Because, folks, wouldn't it be true that it's harder to have faith when it's not seeming to work? Isn't it harder to believe God when you don't have your miracle? Isn't it? Doesn't it require more faith to believe that there is a good and loving God when your life has got pain in it that just doesn't go away? And this is why in Hebrews chapter 11, you have all these amazing stories, one after another, but the climax of the whole chapter is this. These are folks who believe God even though they haven't had the answer. And I suggest to you folks 
that we are talking about a suffering faith, a faith that is able to handle suffering. You know, this is a part of our understanding of faith and how life works that is a little weak in the West because we actually live in a really incredibly good time. When you look at world history, we are living in the West here, especially North America, we are living in a time when there's been very little conflict. There's been conflict in other parts of the world, but not where we live. We live in a part of the world that is the most prosperous in world history. The standard of living that we have in our culture is better than what the kings had in ancient times. And we live in a very blessed and unusual time and place in the world. But when you look at this passage here about these things happening, we don't experience any of these things. We don't have stonings and people being killed by the sword because you believe in Jesus. Uh, We're not wandering in deserts and mountains. We're living in really nice houses with air conditioning and automatic heat in the the wintertime. We, We live very different from this. But there is an aspect of experience for people beyond us that are experiencing this. In fact, it sounds more like the experience of literally millions of believers around the world except here. So for this help, I actually went to the uh, website called the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. And here is a place that you can go and you can learn about what's going on in the rest of the world. And these folks are living Hebrews 11, verse 38. When I went to the website there, I found out that here is a man, Glenn Parker, who is the director of this whole thing. And at age 48, he died of leukemia. What a sad thing. You could just feel the sadness in the, in the, in the, the web description of all this. He was one who got involved researching and informing the world about the persecution of Christians. In fact, the insert in your bulletin comes right from their website. <clears throat> and he pointed out that most of us in the West have not experienced any sufferings like that described in Hebrews chapter 11. And yet he passed away. Would Do you think maybe it's because he didn't have faith? That's why he died? I don't think so. It's that we have to have a further understanding about faith. And we actually need to to develop a theology of suffering. Now, the Bible is clear, actually, all the way through, that when you step forward into righteous living, following after God, there will likely be a reaction from people against that. And that will be called suffering. And when it gets intense, it's called persecution. And there is a theme that runs through Scripture that links righteousness and suffering. It puts the two together. We need some help to develop this one. And an evidence that we don't really have a theology of suffering is when something hard happens and then we doubt our faith and we doubt God. If we have that kind of reaction, it means that we are now being invited to go deeper with God. There is a, a depth of understanding that maybe has to be developed. And it usually has to come through the experience of difficulty. So I want to just take you this morning on a brief look through the Scriptures to see what does the Bible tell us about this difficult subject. It actually starts right at the very beginning. The Garden of Eden. You know the stories well. Adam and Eve are there in the garden. The serpent comes, tempts them deceives them. They choose wrongly. God comes and says, what's going on? And he pronounces there's going to be a consequence to Eve and to Adam. And then he turns to the serpent and he says this, because you have done this, 
Cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You'll crawl in your belly. You will eat dust the rest of the days of your life. I will put enmity, hatred, between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now, you folks are Bible people. You've heard messages about this. We've talked about this. This is the first prophecy that there is someone coming who will crush the serpent's head. But there will be a price to it. You will strike his heel. Other, scriptures, other translations call it bruising his heel. There will be a crushing of the serpent, but it's going to cost. There will be a cost involved with that. So that's the first hint that coming and doing righteousness and bringing justice is going to actually hurt. And you'll notice in the stories in Hebrews 11, all the list of people of faith that are in that chapter there, every one of them was facing troubles and intense times. And it's in those kinds of experiences that we find that God shows up in a miraculous ways, but sometimes He asks us to suffer it. And a theology that is really well-rounded and is holistic in the whole Scriptures will include not only the miracles, but also the suffering. Because the question might be, well, doesn't the Bible talk about there being miracles for those who believe? Yes, it does, actually. Well, doesn't the Bible say that when you, when you follow God and you, and you live His ways, that your life actually gets better? Yes, there are Scriptures that say that. But the Scriptures also say that there's no guarantee that then you will never have any testing and you won't have difficulties to go through. It is very clear to say that there, in this world you will have tribulation. In fact, we, we see that in the prayers of these people. These were the Old Testament saints here. And they had a prayer book called the Psalms. And just notice how many of the Psalms are crying out to God, saying, help me, rescue me. I'm in trouble. Why are the evil people prospering? How come I'm having such a hard time when I'm trying to follow you, God? Where are you? And these are the prayers of the saints who are praying, Oh, God, would you just resolve what's going on here? So there's another hint, not even hint, direct, a direct manifestation that those who are seeking after God and after righteousness do endure suffering. In fact, there's a whole book of the Old Testament that is about this. It's the book of Job. And the story here in the book of Job is about a man who suffers not because of his sinfulness, not even because of living in a fallen world, but a man who is living righteously and blamelessly before God is suffering. And his three friends come, and there's a fourth young guy kind of listening, and he has a little spiel at the end as well. But the three friends bring all the best arguments that you can, ha- you can muster to explain to Job, to Job, it's your fault, Job. You must have been sinning somewhere. You must have secretly said something. That's why you're suffering. And Job says, no, I have not. I've been living a righteous life as best and as I know. And I'm suffering. And the conclusion of the book is that that God is calling us to trust Him even when it looks like life is unfair and when, quote, it's not working. That is when you really have to have faith. And these are those who are commended for their faith and are listed in the hall of fame. Then we come to the New Testament. And Jesus Christ Himself came, lived a perfectly righteous life. And what did He have to do? But suffer. He had to go to the cross. We even sing songs about it. There's something about the suffering, about the blood that was shed, that brings about a 
a restoration of righteousness. And then Jesus Himself said that we have to take up our cross and follow Him. We get to the very last book of the Bible, and the theme is there too, the book of Revelation. It was written by John, the Apostle John, to the churches who were really struggling because there was apparent discrepancy between the belief that Jesus had risen from the dead and God's kingdom was coming and that Christ is Lord, and yet we're living with evil happening to us, with, with the false ideas dominating and even persecuting and killing the Christians. Like, how does this work? I thought Jesus was Lord. And John has to write this book using a beautiful, grand, uh, dramatic description to explain to Christian people that Jesus is revealed in the midst of all this. He's amongst the seven churches, and He's there helping them. Don't fall in your faith. Stay strong. And that there is an end coming. Later in the book, it talks about Him coming with the righteous uh, army with Him, and evil is dealt with. And in the end, the believer is put together in this beautiful picture that the church is described as something like a bride marrying the Lamb. And they live in this beautiful city. This is a message of hope in the midst of suffering, folks. And this is what we have to understand is that as believers, we have to Live in this full understanding of what it means to be in faith. It does mean that your life changes, and it does get better in many ways. But it also means that there may be coming resistance. There may come difficulties. And it also will mean that you can't just pray, and there's always a miracle. Because in the Hall of Fame, those who don't get the miracles are listed as heroes. So we have to live and understand life with a good theology of suffering. And we find that throughout all of Scripture and through all of history, if you have studied anything about church history, you'll know that suffering for those who are living righteously is normal. We live in an abnormal time, folks, but for the rest of the world, in fact, in that insert, you may want to, the print's a little small, but you may want to look at that insert As many as 200 million Christians now are living under some kind of oppression or even direct and violent opposition, living out Hebrews 11. We live in a time and in a place where it's not as evident. But folks, we have a responsibility because this is our brothers and sisters. In fact, One of the Christian families that has had to flee one of these countries, Afghanistan is a country where there has been intense persecution, the killing of Christians and the burning of churches and and horrible things happening. A Christian family had to, many Christians had to flee that country. And we became aware of a family that had to flee Afghanistan and they're actually refugees now in India. We've talked to you about our refugee family that we we have agreed we're going to host. And we just got word this past week that they have their interview now with the Canadian officials, which will start a process that maybe we can actually bring them over here. Folks, we can't can't save everybody, but we can do something. And we as a church are doing something. But beyond that, we need to be in prayer for our people. In fact, uh, there's a short video now I would like to have us uh, watch that gives us uh, a perspective about this, this uh, subject of suffering and the persecuted church. No one is an individual Christian anywhere in the world. We are part of a body. body.
only one body of Christ in the world. And I want to be part of that, in reaching out and supporting whatever they need. Feeling the pain when they are tortured. They have a right to be assisted. It is amazing that in the last number of decades, the number of believers outside of the West has exploded. There's huge revival happening. Millions are turning to faith in Christ. We have often heard that it's the persecution that causes the church to grow. Um, the research that this, these folks have done said it's, it, it's more likely the opposite. As the church explodes in its growth and numbers and brings change to a culture, that's when resistance comes. And so persecution is the evidence of the church growing. And it is difficult. And the, the opposition is very strong. And so as we go to our prayer this morning, let's, let's pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters. Heavenly Father, as we contemplate your church around the world, we are grateful that we live in this unusual place called the West at an unusual time of prosperity and peace. But Lord, we don't want to be unaware and uncaring about our brothers and sisters who have to live under the intense persecution in their country. Father, I pray for your people in the persecuted countries where they are experiencing extreme difficulty. Their churches are bombed. They are being murdered, imprisoned, tortured. Oh God, we pray that you will release your mighty angels around these people and that you will do dramatic things in the midst of all that. And we thank you for the reports that we do hear of dramatic miracles happening in those places. And there's a direct connection between the intensity of persecution and the dramatic miracles that are often manifested. So we thank you, Father, for the miracles that we are hearing and seeing amongst your people that are living in the intensity of Hebrews 11. But we also pray, Lord, for those who are in grief and mourning and who are experiencing loss. Oh, Heavenly Father, we pray that you will notice them and that you will put forth your righteous armies. We thank you that it is happening and that many are coming to faith and we recognize, O oh God, that there is this theme through Scripture that righteousness has a cost to it. It costs you dearly, Heavenly Father. You experienced it yourself. And Jesus, thank you for being willing to take the cross. The worst that the world could do, you bore. And there is something about that bearing of suffering that transforms us. And you've called the church to join you in your work. And so, Lord, I pray for your, per, your church. I pray for our refugee family that have fled Afghanistan. Lord, may we be a place of welcome to them as they come in the next months. And Father, I do pray for us as a congregation here as well that we will be faithful to serve you in the midst of our prosperity. In the midst of a bountiful harvest, Lord, we live here in a wonderful place and we are grateful for it. But we also recognize, Father, that there is spiritual resistance here. That when we want to follow you, life may not always go well. There may be difficulties. 
and that you are putting us also through the training measures of deepening our character. So I pray, Lord, for your grace, your sustaining grace. I pray for people who, who come with heavy burdens on their hearts today. And you, they've been praying about these things, and it's not been resolved. Lord, strengthen them. Deepen their faith with, a, with a, a depth of understanding that suffering and righteousness go together. Lord, in the midst of our problems, we pray that you would do your deeper work in us. So we pray this in the living and resurrected name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now let's receive the benediction. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Amen.